Hey guys, what's up? Um, I'd like to uh, show you and to teach you how to crush black lion positions. Uh, as you know, Ginger GM uh, published out a very nice publication uh, about the uh, black lion opening for black. And uh, it's a very good and aggressive weapon for blitz. Uh, today I just spoke to one of my students, Olga from Turkey, and I sent him regards now. And we just spoke about the line e4, d6, d4, knight f6, knight c3, and e5. What is this? This is like a philidor defense. But in the philidor defense, uh, it's not good to take an e5 right now, because after d takes, d takes, queen d8, that endgame, or let's just say queenless type of middle game, is considered to be good for black. So you just keep the tension in the center, playing knight f3, and they go knight bd7. Here, you should always play first a4 in order to avoid another uh, favorite line by Serbian guys who used to take on d4 and play knight b6, uh, where white's bishop goes on e2. Uh, in this early a4 line, it won't be possible uh, to go with e takes d4 and knight b6, because if that happens, uh, you will always be able to put your light square bishop back on the diagonal a to g8 which basically happened in the game Fedor took against Eric Hansen. So after a4, they gotta go with bishop e7, you just go with bishop c4, and when they go with c6, you go with the short castle. I'd like to talk about this position, and uh, this is uh, very important to emphasize uh, like a couple of very... Uh, important theoretical differences at this point. For example, they can go for short castle, which is nothing else uh, but the Philidor line main variation. And maybe in some of the next videos, if there is like interest, I can show you how you're supposed to treat those positions. But here and in this lecture, I just want to uh, pay attention on more and more popular Black Lion setup. Black Lion setup uh, was massively used by some uh, really good guys, uh, including Simon Williams. But for example, one of the leading Serbian players, Injic, uh, successfully practices this variation and wins most of his games with the Black Pieces. Uh, what's the point? The point is that they want to play queen c7, they want to play h6, not only to avoid knight g5 by black, but also to go with g5. And then queen on c7 will keep an eye on the e5 pawn, while this knight goes back on f8, goes on g6, and they'll be able to launch the kingside attack. From practice of my students, even practiced by myself in the beginning when I didn't know how to trade this line, I had lots of difficulties how to play against this variation. And uh, get ready for not only a good theoretical video, but also like a very important um, strategic lesson because uh, most of this lecture is going to be based on uh, important control of the light squares. So let's get ready. And uh, after you play uh, a four, they can play two kinds of moves. So once again, I'm not going to discuss in this video at all about positions when they play short castle. Because sooner or later, when they play short castle, they're just going to transpose into the Philidor main position. Here, once again, for all of you, let's just clarify that. We're discussing the black lion positions where the queen goes on c7. They play h6, not only to avoid knight g5, but to be able to play g5 afterwards with the knight maneuvering, knight f8 and knight g6. So let's go. They go queen c7. You just go rook e1. Rook on e1 over supports uh, the defense and the pawn on e4. And you, you know what? You just uh, carry on developing your pieces. They go h6. With the h6, just like I previously told you, they do not only stop and prevent knight g5, but they also want to go g5 themselves. Here, uh, I like two approaches. I like approach uh, with a5, where you just want to expand on the queen side. And most of the ideas are going to be very similar uh, to the ones that I'm going to teach you here. 
And I also like the a little bit trickier approach H3. Basically, you just have to see their reaction here and you just have to make a useful move uh, in order to see how are they going to uh, come up with a plan and what's going to be their um, uh, plan afterwards. So here you have equally two good moves, H3 or A5. Maybe A5 is just a little bit uh i don't know without so much risk like the h3 because sometimes h3 when they play g5 goes under the attack with the g5 by black but let me just explain this once i start making the move so you play h3 and they can go with all these uh, approaches uh, aggressive one with the g5 those who play a5 to stop a5 afterwards you immediately play knight h4 i insist on this uh, important um, strategic move because not only you're going to be able to jump on f5, harass the dark square bishop on e7. Uh, from there, I don't know, possibly go into the action and attack on the king's side. But also, they can never play short castle because of this famous rile up as a trick with the knight g6. This is very nice when you have this bishop on c4, and that's important to remember. Um, instead of a5, where you play this in in the case of castle you just play bishop e3 queen d2 or k d1 and now h3 move pays off for you because uh, they're unable to do knight g4 afterwards and this is just a good align one of the main positions and what is considered to be tiny bit better in these games if they play knight f8 without g5 that's inaccuracy i'd say that's inaccuracy because um, now th that allows us to play knight h4 and knight h4 not only stops knight g6 by black but also knight h4 goes with this knight on f5 gives us possibility to break in the center with f4 and uh, makes no sense for black to play for example one of the main ideas g5 g5 would be positionally terrible and if you remember in the beginning of this lecture i told you Check out how important are the light squares in these positions. Once you jump on f5, if they capture, if they capture, you just capture. And now you restrict the knight on f8. You got a bishop here, rook on e1, now got its full roll there. And they just have problems with the e5 pawn in the center. Uh, you, you just want to even uh, pressure more this pawn on e5 by queen e2. In the case of knight g6, you just play queen d3, uh, indirectly defending the knight on f5. And when they go with bishop f5, you just capture knight f4, place your queen here. And once again, you have such a big pressure on the black center that they're going to be uh, very hardly uh, be able to defend. In the case of knight e6, that's good because we just jump on uh, f5, knight e4, and after knight g7, king d8, rook to e3, followed by rook to g3. What a nice plan. Uh, I can hardly imagine that someone can play with the king on d8 and that anyone should be happy with the existing position for black. In the case of knight a to d7, you just jump with the knight on f5. That's a classic idea of the knight h4, bishop f8, and then you just play f4 once again. Uh, trying to take advantage of these bishops on c1 and c1. Uh, pretty good pressure in the center by d4 and f4 pawns, as well as trying to open the rook on e, e1. Knight on f5 does a good job as well. Uh, I, I just want to tell you one thing here. Uh, and the thing that I'm uh, talking about is that how important for all of you is uh, the following move, knight h4. It threatens knight f5, it stops knight g6, it makes g5 absolutely useless, it gives you f4. And by the way, those who forget to play g5 in time, or simply uh, they just uh, intend to play some other type of moves like knight f8 or something else, you just completely paralyze them with the knight h4 move. It's immediately a lot better position for white, and please don't forget about it. And finally, those who play g5. Here, uh, you just have to be ready for a very aggressive approach uh, for black because it perfectly makes sense. Uh, queen on c7 keeps the knight on the pawn on e5. Uh, that means that the knight on d7 is going to be maneuvered to the g6 square by f8. 
and they could launch the pawn storm and the attack on the king side. Probably in a positional game, uh, sorry, in a tournament game, this is not going to be as difficult a uh, variation for white as it looks in uh, faster time controls because you gotta positionally uh, treat the system and to know how to kill them there. So let's get started. You just go with uh, something very useful. What's that? It's a5. It's a, this is, in my opinion, beginning of a crucial plan by white. All together with d5, the whole plan uh, will be based on crushing uh, a6, b7, c6, d6, and e5 structure uh, with two moves by white. a6 and d5. Please don't forget about these two moves by white because this hyper solid pawn structure, uh, almost semana center uh, by black, is about to be broken in a couple of moves. So you play a5, just like I told you, threat is a6 and d5. Uh, they go knight f8. In the case of g4, you capture, and now you have a very special move. It's d5. Don't forget about this one. Makes no sense because you just close the bishop of c4. And uh, anyone can ask me, like, who the hell taught you to play a chess like this? But the thing is, if they play c5, look what you're doing. Playing knight e2, threatening knight g4 with tempo, and this knight actually goes towards c4 square and the full control of the queen side. After rook g8, bishop goes back once again uh, with tempo, threatens on g4, and basically opens up c4 for the knight. When you play a6, when you play knight b5, when you play knight c4, what do you want more than this? I played a couple of blood games online and i easily managed to win even some really good gms because um positionally they're completely lost and i would say they don't have any prosperity in this type of game in the case of c takes d5 you just take by knight threatening queen with tempo and when they play this you just play knight it once again i insist on how important it is to reach the d5 square by knight in these positions. Uh, usually simplifications are good for us. And once again, we're coming up with a thing like, let me bring my knight back on f1, play knight a3 and control light squares, as well as including my rook onto the third rank with the rook a3 and rook c3. This is a good position for one. And finally, in the case of knight f8, if they don't play g4, because early g4 is not obviously good, looks scary because if they play g4, you gotta admit, we're going to be like uh, very confused what's happening on the board. Well, we could be confused uh, uh, or you, you, you could have been, I don't know, like uh, had lots of problems and be really confused unless you check this video and make sure about the following plans so what are we going we once again play d5 because that's our plan on c takes you always take sometimes okay here you you cannot take by knight because they would be able to take the bishop so you definitely have to take by bishop but taking by bishop is absolutely fine because they're not supposed to take on d5 since we're gonna bring our knight with tempo into the center and after queen d8 play b3 followed by bishop b2 or bishop a3 going after all these weaknesses this is how i played a game against i don't know the guy who's around 2950 on chess.com played g4 i played bishop a3 threatening knight e7 followed by bishop d6 played queen d3 and pinning myself and when you take a look at this you just realize that my position was completely positionally dominating and I easily won afterwards. In the case of c takes bishop, d takes a6 to prevent a6. Uh, this is terrible position already because uh, they are absolutely moveless. Uh, you can even move your knight, I don't know, you can even play knight a4, knight b6, rook a3, rook c3, knight e2, knight c4. Lots of possibilities and white. Uh, has an upper hand and uh, in the case of g4 i'm about to show you one very nice example h takes bishop takes and now you play this key breaking move once again 
this is the key positional approach by White, where the lack of the light square bishop on the queen side creates unbelievable weaknesses for black. So when they play b5, you bring it back. You now threaten to take on c6 and to take on b5. Once again, I'll show you a nice blitz game of mine. My opponent was supposed to play either b4, in which case I would bring it back and challenge it with c3, Sicilian idea, or to play knight a to d7. He played rook g8. Well, it looks logical. He just wants to put a rook on the open file and possibly to go with some sort of like pressure against the knight on f3 and the king on g1. Well, it looks scary, but it's not. I captured on c6. <coughs> I apologize. I'm threatening on b5. The guy captured on c6 and I took on b5. But this was just the beginning of his suffering uh, because this yeah. is a typical tactical pattern. Uh, if they capture, we just play bishop a4. So the guy went for knight g6. Looks like, oh, look at this. Uh, I'm threatening knight h4. What are you going to do, Maya? But then I just played knight a7. And with the knight a7, I was threatening bishop a4. And then you just realize once I come up with the bishop a4, if king f8, bishop h6 wins on the spot. If king d8, knight c6 with that winning position. So after a6, b5, bishop b3, they should play like this, but it doesn't change anything. d takes, queen takes, and you play bishop e 3 You basically tie up this rook on a8 for the pawn on a7. Uh, they cannot move it. Uh, you just want to play either knight d5 or bishop d5. And after rook g8, that's exactly what happened in one correspondence game. The guy played h5, queen e2, h4, and played a beautiful rook e c1 followed by c4 idea. I wouldn't go deeper than uh, this because obviously we're about to play c4 followed by bishop a4 or c4 followed by c5 with an amazing uh, control of the game. And finally, if d5, knight g6, which seems perfectly fine, you once again uh, go for the maximum uh, pressure and the maximum, uh, I would say, tension on the black center. This is position. Uh, white uh, has rimmed off. Black can hardly launch the attack because in many lines, white has tactical tricks on the queen side. Although our major approach here is uh, basically... Uh, full control of the light squares in a positional fashion. So after b5, which is practically the only move, you play bishop to b3. <laughs> and the point is, now they have problems with the c6 and b5 pawns. We threaten to take on c6, following by, uh, followed by knight, knight takes b5. And if they go with the b4, you just have this uh, nice, precise intermediary move. Uh, and this is a quite a typical tactical idea. And they just absolutely fall apart. In the case of bishop d7, you capture bishop c6 and the beautiful move happens now. This is probably the most important positional idea that you're about to see in this lecture. It's the knight h2. What's so special about the knight h2? Knight on f6, all together with the bishop on c6, keeps controlling d5 square. By bringing your knight back on h2, and moving it to g4, you just want to remove the knight from f6, and you just want to get like a better control of the light squares, specifically d5 square. So after queen d7, knight g4, uh, now you're about to remove this knight, and this guy now uh, was very happy to trade the queens off, and afterwards played a game with an amazing control of the light squares. He just wants to play knight e5, he just wants to play bishop e3, White was uh, so much better, and eventually he won. Uh, finally, if they move king, king f8, uh, that's pretty logical idea as well. They just want to hide the king on g7. Uh, you just go with d takes e6. And yes, we do not have knight b5 and bishop a4 anymore since the king is now kind of safe on f8. But now uh, we could use the same method like in previous game. So knight h2. Uh, knight goes towards g4, uh, where it, it will try to remove either knight f6, which is the only defender of the d5 square, or bishop c8, uh, which is, theoretically speaking, the only piece that can fight for the light squares. So after knight f4, knight g4, bishop g4, h takes g4, 
uh, rook b8, bishop e3 with tempo, queen c7, knight d5, removing everything, and this is one of the crucial things, to take by piece on d5. Why? You just, uh, they, they would just, uh, you would just have like an amazing blocking piece. They would be forced and compelled to suffer in this game with a backward pawn on d6. But a bishop on e3, pawn on a7 is suffering as well. And this was correspondence game between uh, Wins and Brocker, where White managed to win afterwards. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. I tried to uh, put all the most important ideas with a small amount of time. And uh, I just can't wait to hear about your feedbacks in this variation because it's very interesting. Uh, lately, this variation become one of the most um, common variations in the Blitz practice and black score as well there. So let's now see how are you going to perform. Thanks uh, so much for watching and see you guys.